So I think the best way to do this, next example, what I want to do, I'm going to give you about five to ten minutes where just in a group I want you to work on this one yourself. And then I'm going to solve it. That'll prepare us for Thursday when you're completely on your own. So the problem I want you to consider now is a pretty standard one. It's actually from the book. And we call it the semi-infinite slab. So what we want is the temperature to go to zero as y goes to infinity. So this is x equals zero, y equals zero, and this is x equals ten. And then we're going to set the temperature to be zero degrees on each side and hundred degrees here. And what we're going to solve is just del squared t equals zero. So a steady state temperature distribution, no heat sources that matches these boundary conditions. Of 100 down here, 0, 0, and as this thing goes to infinity, the temperature goes to 0. Now, things are never infinitely long, but there are lots of examples where things are very long. And as long as the edge is far away, that might as well be infinity. Um, I do a, a demo where I hold a steel tube into a flame. And it takes a really long time before my hand gets warm. I mean, this tube's only like this long. But for all practical purposes, that's infinity compared to the distance from the flame. And the temperature is basically, I mean, in that case, room temperature, but it's the infinite limit temperature at my hand. So I want you to take five or ten minutes and just work on this. You can work in groups. You can work with your neighbor. And then we're going to switch and do a solution. Now, when we look at a problem like this, what I like about it, it's going to be a mixture of following our formula, but also thinking about what we're doing with the boundaries. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do it without thinking and show you why, even if you don't think, you can still get the right answer if you're very careful with the formula, which is helpful. So let's start. We have a rectangle, so which coordinate system are we going to use? Cartesian. So using step one, we decide Cartesian. And we get our 1 over x, d squared x, dx squared equals minus 1 over y, d squared y, dy squared. So I skipped a few steps there. What did I skip? Right. So I'm going to assume t of x and y equals x of x, y of y, plug in and divide by t. If you're going to jump right to this on the test, you better write this sentence for me or you won't get full credit. I'll just tell you right now. I, I need at least some words justifying. I don't need all the algebra. If you can do it safely in your head and not miss minus signs, Notice I had to get a minus sign there because I put it on the other side. Um, you're good. Now, I might look at this and go, oh good. I've got my harmonic oscillator equations. I've been doing a bunch of harmonic oscillator equations. So I'm going to set this equal to something interesting. Um, but, you know, let's just be a little non-thoughtful, make this lambda and make this lambda. Right? Those are constants. That's what I'm allowed to do. So I'm going to have the equation, if I take my y equation, of d squared y over dy squared equals minus lambda y. What's the solution to that equation? The easiest solution to this, it's plus i times the square root of lambda times y.
right? Think about that for a second. I'm going to take two derivatives. I could also presumably, can I do a minus? Yeah, I can do a minus because the minuses would cancel. Oops. But I'll leave it as plus for now. Right, the two i's give me the minus, and lambda, square root of lambda times square root of lambda is lambda. So I can solve this. I, I get a slightly ugly looking thing, and I have to realize what it is. But if I just integrated this equation twice, this is what I would get. Now, having done that, I now go to apply the boundary condition. And I need, as t goes to 0, I need, I'm oh, sorry. I need as y goes to 0, infinity, I need t to go to 0. Well, what's the only exponential function that goes to 0 as y goes to infinity? Is exponential decay. So I need an e to the minus ky for this to work. So what I need is minus k to equal plus or minus i times the square root of lambda. So if I'm going to solve for this, I see if I square both sides, this will tell me k squared has to equal minus lambda. In other words, lambda is minus k squared. So if I go back, I realize I should have started the problem with minus k squared. But notice I got there even just by just blindly saying, right, the rule is each of these has to equal the same constant, right? There's no reason I need to get fancy here and put k squareds or minus k squareds or anything like that. It makes the math easier if I can figure out the right constant to put here. But if I don't put the right constant here, I can still solve the problem. And I really wanted to do that explicitly for you so you could see that. Um, you've, you, if you just pick a constant and go, you just have to be careful as you go along. Now, if I was looking at this to begin with, What I realize is with these boundary conditions of 100 here and 0 and 0, in the x direction I need what? I need something that's going to be periodic. And the way I get something periodic is with a negative k squared. Now I look and say, OK, in the y direction is that going to work? And I realize the two minus signs cancel. And d squared y dy squared equals a positive k squared is the equation for an exponential. So this will correctly give me the exponential decay and the periodic signs that I need in the two different places. So exactly what I got by doing it the long way, that my constant needs to be minus k squared, I can get right from the beginning by thinking about the two equations I need to solve and the boundary conditions. So I've already seen this equation becomes d squared y dy squared equals k squared y. Now again, that could be in principle e to the k y or e to the minus k y. But of course, I can't take that because that doesn't work as we go to infinity. Notice. And there will be cases where it's not a periodic boundary situation. You will keep both of these because these are the only ones that can solve the two different values of the two different boundaries. And you're going to get cinches and coshes instead of sines and cosines. So there are places where the two things you will keep will be these two. Okay? So if I had to go from, say, you know, 100 to 20 degrees, not to 0, then in principle, I might need the sum of both of these. Because I have two boundaries 
So I need two constants to be able to match it. Now, in the x direction, I get my usual sines and cosines. Um, and this should be pretty quick at this point. What happens in the x direction? Cosines go away because of the boundary at zero. That's really just a phase choice, by the way. If I define x equals zero to be somewhere else, I'm probably going to use e to the i k x's and make it work. Because then I'm going to treat it probably, even though it's zero at both ends, I'll probably be treating it more as periodic than being zero. If you remember when we did our Fourier series problems, it's nice if you can do it as the zeros because it fits a little bit better at the boundary. But the sums work in either case. And then what happens to k? Remember, this is 10 across. k is equal to what? Not n pi. n, exactly, n pi x over 10. Because the first fundamental is when x equals 10. I want n pi. And this is what you did when you did waves on a pipe, when you did sound waves on a pipe, when you did standing waves, when you did waves on a string. You just have to keep track of what you're doing. Well, if they were constant, non-zero numbers, you now have periodic boundary conditions. I would keep both. And you'd have to solve for A and B. Right? There'd be a relationship that you'd get. The fact that it's periodic would fit K, would fix K, but you'd have A and B left, and you'd have to match the actual value at the boundaries. Yeah. Well, well you just, for each, for each N, you can, yeah, you can plug in and you would do, yeah, you would do the 4A series because you would plug in the X's for the boundary and do that. Which is about what we're going to do now for the bottom boundary here. Right? Because now we have T of XY is the sum over N of A sub N. Notice we know what K is, so we have E to the minus n pi y divided by 10 sine of n pi x over 10. And at y, whoops, at y equals 0, that means we have t of x 0 equals the sum over n a n sine of n pi x over 10. So notice if you had values at x equals 0 and x equals 10 that were not 0, okay, you would have the two extra constants coming in and you would deal with it that way. And now we get to do our favorite what? Projection. Projection. So a sub n is equal to, um, I'm sorry, and this equals 100. So a sub n is equal to 2 over 10, the integral from 0 to 10 of 100 times sine n pi x over 10 dx. And why do I have a 2 over 10 out here? That's my normalization to make it work. How, how do you know that it's a 2 over 10? Um, all I have to do is integrate sine n pi x 10 squared from 0 to 10 and see what number I get. And then I take 1 over that. Because that's our definition of the normalization. Oh, right. you're, you're you want this times itself to be 1. Okay, right. So you need the number out front to make this times itself 1. So you just imagine that this was one of these instead of 100. Now, if you were doing the normal normalization, if you were turning this into the normalization, what do you do? You take 1 over the integral of this times itself and take the square root of it because you're putting a square root with each function. And then what you're doing here is you're putting those two square roots together. That's why there's no square root. Because your sum over here 
doesn't have the normalization, so your AN needs both of them in it. I see, I see. And that's the kind of tricky point, right? It's, if you go back to the lectures on Fourier series, it's the difference between when we did our ket was its normalization times sine. And so our projection had just a square root from that sine times the function. And then when we put a n times our ket into our series, we had a square root times a square root, which gives us the whole thing. Versus here, where there's no square root, so the a n now already has the square root times the square root. So I realize that's the most confusing notation I could probably come up with for anything. But if you look back at our Fourier series lecture, I do a direct comparison between putting all the normalization with the AN because your series isn't normalized versus normalizing your basis functions ahead of time. But at the end of the day, since you do AN times the function, the square roots work out. When you do this, just so you have the answer, but it's in the book, when you go through all of this, you get 400 over n pi if n is odd and 0 if n is even. So your final answer for the temperature distribution is sum over the n's odd of 400 over n pi e to the minus n pi y over 10 sine of n pi x over 10. And you should do, I really encourage you, do some 2D plots of this. Obviously, you can't go to infinity, but you can go to a, a large number in y. Um, take a few terms and see that it's 100 and it goes to 0. Notice it's going to have to do some slightly weird things at the corner. This is always the problem with these. Right? Is it 100 at the corner or is it 0? You know. In, in real systems, obviously, these corners just vary rapidly but have some smooth variation. Um, so there's always a little bit of an approximation, and so you can get some wiggles there that don't quite make sense. But other than that, it all works and looks good. Any questions? <coughs>